Hello, everybody, and welcome to Enrich TV Enrich Podcast. And today I have a special guest who comes from the United States, and he has done a lot of goodness in this world in the area of longevity. Jason Prawl is with us, and I'm uh, very excited to, to welcome. Hello, James, and thank you very much for your time and your um, uh, presence to be there. It's great to, to see you, and thanks to this technology, we can connect across the ocean. Yeah, I'm assuming it works, and so far so good, so thanks for having me. Jason, straight away, tell us more about this project of longevity, why you started it, and what is your mission? Yeah, the Human Longevity Project kind of was, um, it was an idea that we had uh, two years ago that really, we wanted to look at health, right? So a lot of, in what, what work that I do, which is in sort of the chronic disease stuff, um, you know, we, we talk about disease, we talk about how to resolve it, how to find out what the root causes of disease, but a lot of times we forget what health is, where it comes from. And so uh, I, I wanted to bring out a message of health um, from my philosophy. And I thought, you know, there's, some been, there's been some work done on some longevity areas around the world that I thought would be a really good template, a, a good way to open this discussion. So we traveled around to these places in Okinawa and in and, and Costa Rica and Italia, Greece and Sardinia, Italy, to... Uh, to get a picture of the historical nature of the lives of these people that are living to 90, 100 and beyond. Because I think that's the important thing that is often forgotten about in the longevity discussion or the health discussion, which is how did people live 50, 60, 70 years ago, you know, when they were in their 20s? How were they giving birth? How were they being raised, right? And this is often forgotten about. So, so I wanted to get these stories from these individuals. So we went around to these places, interviewed a, a number of people to discuss the past, how they lived, but also discuss where they're at now, because I think this is an important factor when we talk about the future, right? Um, and I think Okinawa, and we can get into this, but uh, Okinawa is probably the most interesting case study in this regard when it comes to a once really, really healthy place known for its longevity to now becoming pretty standard when it comes to Japan, uh, Southeast Asia, and maybe even the broader sort of um, developed world in general. It's now following some of the, the trends that we're seeing in, in other parts of the world. So I think we have to look at the big picture and um, use it as a way to uh, to understand how to move forward. And that was really the, the, the point of our you know, nine-part documentary film series was to bring about this conversation of health, but also in the context of where we're going in the future, because the future is, is not going to look anything like the past 100 years. So when you study what a 100-year-old, you have to look at the past 100 years, right? It sounds obvious, but but oftentimes we forget. And so I think this is the bridge that we that we wanted to sort of uh, cross and, and, and present and hopefully get people to think about in a new way. That's a, that's a really interesting angle and the fact that you jumped on this idea. I mean, tell us a little bit about your background. What, what, uh, what were you doing before this uh, two years ago? Now everyone knows you, James Prowl, Longevity Project, but what was your history and background? Well, my my background is in mechanical engineering. So I was uh, I worked in a number of different fields in the engineering, sort of mechanical materials uh, engineering space, and it was all what I recognized in that in that that part of my life or that skill set was that you know my inherent um, I guess trait or skill that I brought to that that profession was the ability to think in systems, right? So systems thinking, this ability to kind of look at the big picture, put the pieces together and figure out a good way forward and how to sort of optimize that process, right? That, that's really what I was good at. And so through my own health challenges, I was kind of forced to do this on my own biology, my own body, right? Because the chronic things that I was dealing with, doctors weren't helping. And so this just, uh, you know, I didn't really choose this. It sort of chose me in, in a sense that you know, I was dealing with this crap and I had to either figure it out or deal with it. And so, you know, I chose to sort of figure it out. And so my sort of systems thinking can be very well applied to biology, to human health, uh, because it's probably the most complex system that it, it, that exists. Right. So um, and the irony, I guess, of the whole thing is, is that um, no matter how good of a systems thinker, thinker you are, I think at some point you recognize the limitation to what you can even understand. And I think that brings about the beauty and the mystery behind 
our biology, our health. What the heck is it? Where does it come from? Um, is there this divine presence? You know, what is it that is really animating this life force, right? And so to me, it was it was sort of my pride in uh, discovering things with, with sort of a, a uh, systems thinking approach, uh, only to bump up against the limitation of our understanding and recognizing that we probably will never understand it using science that there has to be this sort of trust in nature or trust in God that we can then bring with us to understand that it's already there. And this was to me was the key insight that I eventually got to was that health is already there. It's innate. It's built within you. It is sort of the divine presence within. It is the light. It is there. We have to unleash it. We have to allow it. We have to uh, stop restricting it with our behaviors, our ideas, our thoughts, our, our emotions and our environment. And if we can correct those things, then the health can be brought forward. And to me, this is the way to think about longevity, think about health, uh, spiritual health, mental health, emotional health, physical health. It's all sort of tied up together um, and it's all coming from the same place, wherever the heck that place is. Yes, excited. What is happening now for you now that you've learned this how are you going to apply it in your life where are you going to take it yeah i mean honestly um for me what the, the point that i'm at now is to kind of just allow right so uh sort of my engineering type a personality that that was once there and probably still is there to some degree has sort of given way to um letting go right so this process of letting go and allowing things to just come about following my passion, following, you know, what, what feels right to me, listening to my intuition, right? I mean, these are some of the lessons that you learn when you go and talk to these people that are 95, 102, you know, et cetera, is that you, you learn to, um, they, they bring with them a message of, um, appreciation of gratitude of, of being present, um, you know, of, of not overthinking, of good relationships. So, so these are all just the qualities, and, and these have been passed down through spiritual traditions and religious traditions, shamans. I mean, if you go back to any ancient tradition, these sort of lessons are built within that tradition. So um, for me, it's just a matter of sort of exploring that sort of more spiritual side or religious side of, of things um, to allow those to come forth and teach me whatever the heck I'm here, you know, to be taught and, and hopefully to share with others. Right. And for us humans who live in the cities, who live in a stressful environment, uh, ambitious, uh, many, many of ambitious people are insecure at the same time, right? So we, we are disconnected from our roots and we're in cubicles, living in concrete, you know, blocks, uh, in very high vibe in cities. But still, you know, we, we do have, hence we have health issues. So what would be your advice? Like, give us some practical tips, you know, what can we do? Uh, you're 100 percent correct, and I lived in uh, the city of Seattle, which is a very busy sort of hub in in the Pacific Northwest in the states. And um, you know, it's it's a fast environment that is overloading us with stimuli, right? Which means that there's just so much going on. It throws our nervous system out of balance. Okay, now our nervous system has two components. One is the sort of stressed out mode, which keeps you uh, allows you to deal with stress, physical stress, emotional stress, biochemical stress, etc. Then there's the other side, which is sort of the rest and digest, right? And the stay and play, or, you know, this is where we, we recover, we heal, we have sex, we digest food, right? This is like the good stuff. And so basically, to some degree, everything we want is on that side, right? And yet everything we do is on the other side, which is we're, we're not sleeping very well. We're emotionally and mentally stressed out. We are overloading ourselves with tasks. Right. And so this ability to be autonomous, right, through technology, this is the irony, is that as technology has come on board, we've taken on more things. Right. One of the people in the documentary um, says, you know, 20 years ago, you, you had a travel agent to book your, your, your complex travels. Now, who's the travel agent? Right. And he points to himself. And I thought it was a perfect example. It's like, yeah, it's easy to book travel. But at the same time, we're doing more of those things. Right. So. So I think we have to recognize that because we can do more, we are doing more, sometimes we just need to do less, right? And so for a busy professional, for somebody with ambition, somebody that's trying to do big things, maybe they're running four or five companies, maybe they have five kids. I mean, there's just a million things going on. It's not to say that you have to get rid of those things. I think the, the, the practical tip is to realize what is not useful in your life and get rid of it, right? If you have a lot of business people listening to this, one of the most effective things you can do as a business is get rid of waste, 
wasted operation, wasted inventory, wasted uh, everything that's waste, get rid of it, right? And that is that if that makes your business more efficient. You know, life is no different. So if you have somebody that's really skilled in business, I would actually tell them to look at their life as a business. How do you improve operations? How do you improve profitability, right? Which would be sort of the health side of the equation. So do less. You know, don't do more than necessary based on what your ambitions and goals are. If you're doing things that you don't even love, then find a way to either incorporate more things you love or move your path to something you love. This is what I did, you know, and, and it's a, not an easy path sometimes, but it's very doable. Everybody does this, you know, in some fashion in their life. Many people do it in a big way in their careers and in their in their worldview. So I think getting rid of things that are not necessary, slowing down, taking the opportunity and the caught, we have to now make a conscious cho choice to slow down because everybody is telling us not to sleep. Everybody's telling us to do more. And, you know, time is money and all these things. And it feels like time's moving faster, right? And so we have to slow it down. We have to find ways to slow down. This is easy. This is meditation. This is um, eating a, a meal with your family. If that's not typical for you, find a way to work that in. I mean, some of this is hard, you know, it's hard to get going, very easy to do, very hard to start. So you have to maybe make a little extra effort to start some of these things. But once they're in your, your you know, habitual patterns, they're very simple, right? I mean, sitting down uh, quietly without cell phones and TVs with a meal with your family is not hard. This is very simple. This is what humans have been doing for thousands of years. And in some cultures, you know, in some uh, countries that, that are probably listening to this right now, this is what they do. So some of this advice may even sound silly to some of the people that, you're, that, that are listening. And I understand that because I've done enough travel to see that some of the norms out there, I wish we could apply to the U.S. and, you know, some of the Western nations. But so slowing down, um, looking back at your culture and finding out some of these practices that, that came with your culture, I think is an often very good way to do this, whether it's prayer, whether it's meditation, whether it's walking in, in nature, whether it's taking Sundays off, I mean, whatever it is for you, I'm going to church. I mean, this is, we're missing these ritualized, community-based, community slowing down, you know, um, things that, that bring with them meaning. So I think it's very simple. Focus on the things that are gonna slow you down. Focus on sleep, focus on play, on fun, on art, on creativity, on breathing, on meditation. I mean, these are just very, very simple things. But as you can bring more of those into your life, you now tip the scale, it, it tip the balance into more of the rest and digest, the play, the sex, the good stuff that we all want that will help us heal, feel better, and enjoy life more. Because when we're in that other side of things, we're focused on the past, we're focused on the future, we are stressed out like crazy, and this is the point that does damage to our health, does damage, and this is physical health, mental health, emotional health, et cetera. To try to get away from that completely is, is pretty tough. Um, you know, you're getting into some more of the spiritual Buddhist kind of shamanistic stuff about being present all the time. But I think just being present and taking a moment to recognize I'm here, I'm healthy, I'm happy, you know, just being grateful for for breathing, right? I mean, these are simple practices that I think we just have to come more into the present moment and slow things down. Beautiful. How do you apply this in your life now, days? I mean, tell us a few examples what you've learned from this project of uh, research. And there were four islands in Loma Linda, part of California, right? So what were the nuggets that you've collected and implemented that helped you in your life? Well, a lot of this stuff I was already using, right? So for me, I was studying health for quite some time. So a lot of this was sort of part of my daily practice. Some of it got reinforced when I was in these places, and some of the there was new insights, you know, and some of the new insights were more for me about the environment, you know, how much our environment actually influences us. In other words, just because you know something is healthy, be it, if your environment is showing you something different or doing something different, it's very difficult to, to step outside of that on your own, right? So some of this stuff, when it comes to health, actually has to do with the people around you, the habits around you, the culture around you, and how you live. So in other words, if I move to the Nicoya uh, Peninsula in Costa Rica, you know, all of a sudden I slow down. And this was something we felt when we traveled there. We immediately showed up and it felt like time stopped. It felt like we had more time to do things 
than we actually did. And we were there for work. We were not there, you know, sipping Mai Tais and, and laying on the beach. We were there for work and we had a limited time. We had to go find these hundred year olds and talk to them. So it was in a way stressful, but yet time slowed down. How do you explain that? This was a feeling. This was um, a quality of time that is not logically based. And yet you felt it. And then we got back to the United States. It felt like I was late for something. It felt like time was speeding up. Uh, I had a million things to do. And yet nothing really changed. So the environment is really, really important. So if you're somebody out there that doesn't like where you live or you're unhealthy or you feel like crap, maybe going to a new environment that is more in alignment with who you are and what, or what you want, that might be more beneficial. Now, the hard part about that is, is that we are social creatures. So if we step into this new environment that is healthy, but yet we don't speak the language and we don't know the culture and we don't feel like we belong, that that may damage the health too. So, so your environment is really, really critical. Can you find a way to improve the environment around you or, or go to a new environment that is more suitable to your health? This really was probably the most profound thing for me that I think I learned when going to these places. In terms of some of the things that I think are most important that people can apply, um, I think getting back in touch with nature, it just as a general broad statement, I think is probably the most effective uh, thing I can communicate. You know, And this means going outside, getting your feet on the ground, exposing yourself to natural light, both in your eyes and on your skin, because that influences you, the way your biology works. Light actually affects hormones. I mean, if you're depressed, go outside. If you are you're not getting good sleep, go outside. All these things, if, if, you, if you're trying to have kids and you can't have kids, go outside. All of these things actually influence hormonal production, the way the cells function. So simply going outside and getting natural light in the winter, in the summer, in the spring, doesn't matter, actually changes your health. So that's just one example. But, you know, swimming in oceans or lakes or rivers, um, just walking through a forest, we know changes our neurotransmitters, which means our changes our mood and behavior, you know. So right now, you know, and I speak from a U.S. centric standpoint, which is I see a lot of anxiety. I see a lot of ADD and ADHD. We are very hyperactive. We can't pay attention to anything. We are too stimulated. And so sometimes just going out in nature alone um, calms that down and brings that sense of balance. So the more we can get in touch with nature, understand, respect nature and recognize that whatever we do to nature comes back to us. I think now we start moving the needle in the right direction because we're poisoning the environment, therefore we're poisoning ourselves. We don't look at it like that because it's a long feedback loop, but at the end of the day, we've been poisoning the planet for you know, a good 70, 80 years now, um, some places more than others, and the feedback loop is now picked up in a big way. So this is why we have so many environmental toxins and garbage in our environment that's affecting us biologically. And it's sad that we can't do anything about it. Um, we can't do anything about the fact that we are toxic, right? And we have polar bears in the Arctic that have perfluorinated chemicals in their bodies. So it's, you know, there is no place on the planet left that is totally pristine. Um, the thing that we can do now is improve our function so that we can get rid of this stuff out of our body as best we can, and also stop polluting the environment and the more local you can make this, the better. So if you clean up your household, you clean up your local environment, that's going to have the most impact on your personal health. And it's also the thing that you can control the most, right? So we have these big visions about the changing the planet. Well, change your room first, right? Then change your household. Then change you know, your, your community. Then change your city, et cetera. So start with you and work your way out, outward and find ways to clean that up, right? Get Think about nature like like a native would, right? A Native American, a Native Australian, you know, all these native cultures, you know, Native Central and South Americans, they had a respect or reverence for nature and they worked with it because they understood they are part of it. They they are it. And we have now had this sense of separation from, from nature, sense of separation from the earth. And we are now doing things that are totally uh, disharmonious with what nature does. And there's consequences for that. So it's not a dire picture necessarily. It's more of one of responsibility. We need to start taking responsibility, understand where we're at in the game and make the changes that we need to make. And if we have the courage to do that, even on the micro scale, 
all of a sudden things change in a big, big way, right? So uh, it, on one hand, you can look at this as very grim, you know, that we're just basically poisoning the planet. The bees are almost like dead. I mean, this is crazy. We're in a crazy spot. But on the other hand, you look at it and go, oh, we just need to make a, a little bit of change. And all of a sudden, it, it fixes everything, right? I mean, we, we really can make a massive difference by making the smallest changes. So um, again, just, just like our bodies want to heal and have health built within, so does the earth, right? The earth cleanses itself naturally, right? And we just have to harmonize with that a little bit. So the one of the biggest takeaways that you come away with when you go visit these these villages in Costa Rica or or you know in Sardinia is that you recognize that they they're with nature they're flowing with it they are growing food i mean this is their life they are amongst it they're they're moving with it we are we are kind of moving against it in the western world right we stay up late we have artificial lights on when it should be dark we you know when it's light out we are inside with artificial lights we don't get natural light you know we we close ourselves off from it we don't even have natural you know airflow we are poisoning the environment. We're just so disconnected from it. We're ripping it up and tearing it up and putting, I mean, in, in, in parts of the U.S., we have artificial lawns. I mean, this is crazy, you know. So we're just doing weird things to our environment, and we, we don't operate within it. So, so that is probably, if you go to these places, and I know a lot of people talk about longevity and they try to study it, but when you go to these places, you instantly feel it and you, and you understand why they have longevity. It's because they're all working together with each other, with themselves, with God, with nature, however you want to quantify this, but they're all playing a role that is synergistic. So the more we can get in touch with that, I think the better off we'll be, knowing that, look, we live in a modern world and we may not be perfect and we have big ambitions and goals to change the world and some of that might require us driving our car or you know some of these things that harm the environment. So I think there's a dance that we have to sort of engage in a little bit. But I think where we can... Where we can make better choices, I think that's that's what we need to do. Wow. And talking about choices, as the future going to present to us many choices, especially uh, together with technology and their artificial intelligence. And we now know where we're going in terms of the economics in the developed world. I think the gap yeah. between the developing countries and nature is going to be even further. How do we reconcile this you know, from your perspective, studying the past? Because the 100 years old people, indeed, they probably lived without any technology uh, yeah. for most of their life. And now we are in the middle of huge revolution. I think it's going to be, you know, AI is going to be another electricity. You know, it's like going to change everything, especially in big cities or even economies where the developed world. How do we deal with that in the future? Uh, this is going to be our big challenge, right? And I think this is the spiritual challenge. This is the philosophical challenge that, that we all face. And I don't know that I have an answer. I will say that I'm not afraid of it. I think it's very interesting. Um, I think it's going to be fun to, to, to come up against this and figure out where we want to go. I don't know that there's a right or wrong way. I think whatever we choose, there's going to be consequences, um, depending on how we define good and bad. Um, you know, who's to say we should even live a long life? Who cares about living a long life, right? If I live an amazingly impactful and beneficial life and I, um, I, then, you know, do I need to live a long time? Or if I live a long time and I poison the environment, I don't like myself, I don't even want to be here. What's the point of that, right? So I think we have, there's no right or wrong answer here. I think what I would say, the way we need to think about this is that the tools are getting sharper, right? A knife can be used to kill somebody or it can be used as a scalpel to save somebody's life in surgery, right? So I don't think there's a good or bad. We have to just recognize that the tools we're creating, they have consequences depending on how we use them. And so, you know, I will say that I, I totally disagree with this idea of singularity, that we can upload consciousness to a machine, that we're going to merge with machines. Um, I, I don't think that that's accurate. I don't think it's possible. And I don't think that that we would even want to, even if it were possible. And, and the reason I say that is, is comes from a point of studying health, studying the body, studying how the body works. And it is infinitely complex. We don't even understand what consciousness is. And we're talking about uploading it. I mean, I think we're just, we're kind of children wandering in a forest. We don't have any clue what we're talking about. Um, I don't think you can upload or download consciousness. I think it just kind of is. That's my personal opinion on it. Um, 
I, I don't think that you can merge a human with a machine um, they, because we're talking about the life force that animates a, a human being. How can that animate a machine? It doesn't work like that. Um, humans alone are made up of biological organisms like bacteria and viruses that work with us, with our own DNA. Um, and you, you are more viral and bacterial DNA and cells than you are human cells. So what are we even talking about, right? So I, I think we're so far off base in that sort of big thinking that I'm not really worried about it. I think it'll come to light the fact that, you know, they thought that when we were going to map the human genome that we're going to be able to end all disease. And, and then we realized, oh, wait, we don't have a clue what we're talking about. Well, we still don't understand it, right? So all we did was recognize how, how off we were. So I'm not worried about that. I think the tools that we create, if if I were to sort of project out, I, I would want them to help us understand ourselves better, help us to make better choices, right? And so there's this idea that if you study nature and sort of copy it or mimic it, right, biomimicry, then we can use that in a more effective way. To me, that's from an engineer standpoint, a, a much smarter way to do things because the, my philosophical standpoint is that nature has already figured it out, right? And you can think, call, call this nature, God, universe, whatever you want to call it, but it's already there. It's already figured out. It's already figured out the most efficient way to do things. And we just need to harmonize with that. And so when we create this new 5G technology um, and we start to understand how that does not harmonize at all with nature, then we can basically come up with a pretty easy assumption that it's going to be harmful. And if you study electromagnetic waves and, and this sort of microwave radiation that 5G is, it's not, it, it's pretty well based that it's going to be damaging, right? So I think like all of human history, we're going to skin our knees a little bit. Everything that comes out, we're going to kind of screw it up a little bit. We're going to recognize, oh, wait, whoops, we shouldn't have done that, right? I mean, this is kind of our history. This is kind of what we do, right? We, we are kind of children figuring this stuff out. So I think that the sharper the tools get, the more damage we're going to do right off the get get go, and the more sort of recognition we're going to have to sort of self correct, right? I, I think this is just how it is, and hopefully we can minimize that as we go. But at the end of the day, I think we have to go back to a philosophy, right? And you can go back to Aristotle and and some of the Stoics, and or you can go back to you know Judeo uh, Christian Judaism Judaism uh, sort of thinking. Um, to recognize that we have to figure out why we're here, what we want, who we are. You know, um, the Buddhists talk about this, the Taoists talk about this. It goes back into all religious and, and uh, historical texts. And I think we have to sort of continue to ask ourselves these questions, right? And I think if we understand who we are as individuals and what we really want and how we work collectively, I think we'll come up with better answers. But to my estimation, we have missed the philosophical boat. We are not studying philosophy anymore. And I think philosophy allows yourself to ask good questions about yourself, to yourself, etc. cetera. Um, and I think just by doing that, we start to eliminate all this external need and desire and want. I mean, we're making things more efficient and, and um, you know, I guess convenient, but who cares, right? In other words, why does that matter? And if you don't, if you haven't asked yourself that, you know, why am I trying to be more efficient? And does that make me happier? Why am I trying to be more wealthy or get more things or be more recognized? Like, these are the philosophical questions that we have to ask ourselves. So I think if we bring back in some of this philosophy, I think we'll, we will inevitably have better outcomes in terms of what, what we want. Um, I think we are chasing things that we don't really want, and it's going to manifest in a life that we don't really want. And we're going to wonder why the heck we're not happy. And we see this throughout all the modern societies. You look at the happiest places around the world, and happiness is a hard thing to judge, but you consistently come up with Costa Rica and Bhutan as places that are pretty darn happy. And you look at them and you go, well, they don't have the latest technology. You know, they're, they, they, they're, the convenience is not there, historically speaking. So why are they the happiest, right? And so um, we have to go back and tap into some of the, the cultural philosophy, you know, the ancient philosophy, ask ourselves who we are, what we want. And I think that will allow us to make better choices as technology continues to move forward. And it'll be really exciting if we, if we can merge those two, our ability to sort of use technology and sort of a, a right philo philosophical uh, view on this stuff. I, it's like, to me, that's what I'm excited about. And I, we'll get there. I just don't know how it's all going to unfold. Yeah, know thyself, as Aristotle said. And also, it's an interesting dilemma for me personally, and I'm sure for many people, how do we reconcile the 
cognitive expansion of our brain, which is very, very sharp and we're very quick and find the solutions and fix things. And that's why we are so attracted to efficiency and productivity and making you know faster things, bigger things, uh, more exciting things. We're overloading and you know this you started with the stimuli, right? How many stimuli we have during the day? And the other part, which is the relaxation and going to nature and having both of these in our balanced life, that's going to be our quest. Um, yeah, and I think to some degree, you know, um, I would probably speak to a lot of your listeners because if they're anything like me, they're in their heads a lot. Um, and I think some of this, we have to bring it back down to our hearts, right? So it's, um, you know, you can even look at the science behind this now. You have Heart Math Institute that is looking at the coherence between the heart and the brain. And what we're recognizing is the heart is basically much more active than the brain. And it actually has uh, neurons like the brain. So um, the heart is kind of a brain in and of itself. And so when, when, when you feel something in your heart, there's actually an, a, um, a wisdom or a knowledge that's actually there, just like in the brain. So I think some of this we have to get into the rest of our body too, and not just in our sort of cognitive, you know, conscious mind that we, we want to get into our heart and our gut and, and feel and, and this type of thing, right? Let the feelings kind of happen too. So if we can do that, you know, I think that's, that's a, a key going forward. And, and if you ask most people what the most important thing in their life is, especially if you ask somebody on their deathbed, it never comes down to, I'd say never, it rarely comes down to the cognitive aspects of life. It always comes back to the feeling aspects of life, right? The love, the thing that they did or didn't get to do, right? The, the time spent with friends and family, right? So isn't it interesting that, and this is what you find when you talk to 105 year olds um, around the world, like we did, you hear that there is this, there's more of a quality on the feelings, on the emotions, on the love, on the compassion, on the forgiveness. This is, to me, if, if you hear this from a, a number of 100-year-olds, like we did, the same thing over and over again, and you don't listen, then you're just, you know, being sort of an ignorant child, right? And I think this is kind of, to some degree, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we're young, so yes, we are kind of figuring this stuff out in our own lives, right? But I think we can, we can skip that step to some degree and listen to these 100-year-olds because they constantly say, the, the, thing, the, the key to a long, healthy, happy life is to hold no grudges with those around you, to make peace with everybody, right? To, um, to have love and compassion. I mean, it doesn't get any simpler than that, right? Um, so I think, we, again, it goes back to what do we really want. And I think sometimes we're thinking about things too much, about how to run our lives. We forget to feel and be in our life, right? Because all you have is today, right? It's the ever-present now. There, that's all there ever is. So are you in a state of compassion, of love, of, of gratitude right now? Or are you worried about the future, right? And if you're always worrying about the future, then you'll never catch up, first of all, and you'll forget to be in the now. So you'll live a life ne that's never based on being in yourself and knowing yourself. So um, again, it kind of comes back to the same types of things that if we're just present, if we are uh, grateful, if we have good relationships, right? And, and and it's not something you can just flip a switch, right? This is, this, you have to get out of the cognitive part of this, right? So I'm, I'm saying this and everybody's probably listening going, yeah, okay, of course, yes, makes sense. That's obvious, right? Then the question is, how do we get into our hearts? How do we feel that? How do we do that, right? And I think this is kind of the practice of life, right? To sort of let this unfold for you and continue to make an effort, a conscious intention to, to be that, right? To be in your present self, to, to love, to have compassion. I mean, this is, is a challenge for a lot of us. And, and here's something I, will, I really wanted to say to your audience. If they are go-getters, if they are successful people, if they're entrepreneurs, if these type of individuals, because this is something I recognized in myself and with a lot of people I worked with. Oftentimes, the thing that creates um, a successful person is trauma from childhood. In other words, whether it's a divorce, whether it's somebody that mentally or physically or sexually abused you, these things often come from childhood that create this sense of accomplishment, right? In other words, I wasn't getting love at home, so therefore I had to excel at something, whether it was the violin, whether it was you know, reading comprehension, whether it was really good writing or ballet or whatever it was for you, you excelled at something and then you got rewarded. 
you know, with love and, and admiration. And then that sort of created this feedback loop of, okay, well, I got that. So I'm going to keep doing this. And then you get better and better at it. And then you become very successful at something because that's where you're getting your love and your admiration. So um, one thing I will, I will sort of give to your audience is to um, just, just some advice to look at that in their own life and figure out, you know, is that, is there a source of that? You know, could that be why you're so successful? It's because you've always had to, to prove something to somebody or you've had, that's how you've gotten love. And it's not a bad thing, right? And, and the way I view these things is that these are sort of pressures on you and they've created uh, the person you are, right? So, I mean, to some degree, you actually have to be, I think it's better to be grateful for them that you were given that, that rough road or that thing that you dealt with that created the person you are today. The thing that we, that I would advise people to look at is, can I resolve that now? Is there, do I need to go back and still resolve something? Is there something still there in my subconscious that is creating the patterns and the habits maybe of unworthiness of, you know, whatever it is, there's all these sort of things that are sort of locked up in, and they get locked up in the subconscious mind and in our body. So if you have health issues or if you feel like something's not right, um, take a look at your life and see, you know, is there something in childhood that you can remember? And it can be a, you know, a, a nasty divorce. It can be just the fact that your parents were not there to love you. It can even be, um, you know, uh, a cord wrapped around your neck in the birthing process that brought you into this world in a stressed out state, uh, state that basically said this world is not a safe place and you weren't getting the proper care. Maybe you were, if you were in the West, in the US, maybe you were, the cord was cut when you were a baby and you got shipped off to a UV lamp, right? This is what we do now in, in hospitals, unfortunately. So it can be a lot of these things that you may not, not have a clue about. So sometimes there's some work that we need to do in the past to sort of resolve some of that, heal some of that stuff. And yet we still get to be the person that we are, which is ambitious and, and all these things. But I think it can give way to uh, less stress, less um, anxiety. And you now have your skill sets, but you're also kind of in the flow, right? And so um, this is a big one for a lot of successful people uh, that, that, that I work with that are sick. And they're trying to figure out, okay, I have digestive issues or I have, um, you know, could be rheumatism, you know, pain and all these things, whatever it is, all kinds of symptoms maybe even cancer. And they say, well, why am I sick? And I evaluate their life and I'm like, okay, well, you're really successful and you do all these things. You're amazing, uh, amazing, father, amazing. You're, you're amazing in every single way, but you're doing it because you're still trying to sort of get love or get attention or get admiration. And that comes from childhood, right? So, um, and that might, might, might not be the only thing, but it often drives us. And so, and sometimes that pattern gets locked in to where your conscious mind is not even there anymore. This is just a subconscious pattern that's there, it's locked in. And to free that up, I think can free up a lot of things in our life for us to do more, to be more for ourselves, for the people around us, you know, and, and just operate in a better patterned environment. Just music to my ears, because the work that we do is systemic and we're healing the past and generational traumas and patterns that are not serving us anymore. And uh, we, gathering also for the next year so it's perfect to actually i'm going to post this on my linkedin profile for people who are <laughs> <laughs> well it's massive i will say that this is not a small thing um the people that come to me i often get really complex cases they've been to all kinds of functional doctors and integrative doctors and naturopaths and you name it and they can't figure out what's wrong and, and it generally comes down to a few things and past emotional traumas or inherited traumas in my opinion are always number one they're always there. It may not be the only thing, but they are always there. And then it's not a small thing. It is massive because it, it, it influences your behavior and it influences the systems of the body. Okay. So this is not conscious control. This is the way your nervous system is functioning. This is, this is everything in your body. You may not have a clue what's happening and you may be doing everything right. Great diet. You work out, you get good sleep. This was my story, right? I kept chipping away and doing all the healthier, more and more healthy things until I got to the point where I recognized, oh crap, there's some trauma there that I need to go back and work on. And, and to some degree, I'm still working on this. This is not a, a quick and easy process. Sometimes it can be very, very in depth and there's a lot of layers to it. Um, but I think part of the, of working through that is to recognize that it's a gift, recognize that it's there, just like a hurdle, right? If you don't jump over the hurdle and you keep running into it, yeah, you know, it doesn't feel like a gift. But if you've learned to jump, um, all of a sudden, you know, it can be a gift. And so um, I think when you get to that point, you know, it becomes sort of this fun process of healing um, and learning more and, and providing you with the sense of more 
inquiry about life and about what's there and what's underneath all this because it gets cooler and cooler the deeper you go and i think that was a real fun part for me to get to that point and recognize okay this is a gift it's all there for you you know um if you use it and choose to see it that way then it can sort of birth you into this world anew if you continue to fight it and resist it and challenge it and want to get rid of it you know you're just basically gonna it's gonna keep slapping you up upside the face a little harder each time and you're gonna suffer all the way until you finally let go of that and allow it to sort of manifest through you so um it can be a a process but I, i will say that engaging that process for me and for the clients that i've worked with has been the most transformational thing that that they've done um because it allows you to see the world in a new way wow thank you for the soulful and meaningful conversation it uh, really of I, feel, I feel enriched uh, just by talking to you <laughs> no, well thank you that's <laughs> fantastic compliment i love that <laughs> that's fantastic and thank you very much it's uh it's a journey for many people. We're all part in a different, meet on different uh, crossroads and paths. And I'm sure I have, I have some belief that we're going to meet again. And uh, I wanted to introduce you to people who um, I deal with and work with and uh, my friends and family. So they already know where you're going and what's your next adventure? What are you going to focus on next? It's actually a very good question. Um, to some degree, um, I'm, I'm very much in the process of letting things unfold. I mean, this is sort of the weird paradox of like, I wish I could give you an answer because I actually want an answer myself. <laughs> There's still that part of me that like wants to control the future. Um, but no, honestly, um, I'm, I'm very excited about letting things take, take, their own course. And, you know, if I look back at my life and figure out when I made the change from engineering into the health, could I have ever imagined that this is where I would have ended up? And the answer is no, 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 it's not even close. There's no, no way I could have predicted this, planned for it, um, or anything, right? So to me, this is the fun stuff. It's like, I don't know where I'm going, you know, I just know ultimately really what I want to do. Um, and, I keep putting, I keep showing up every day with that in mind, right? So some days it's menial tasks, like crap I don't want to do. You know, like I, some things I just don't want to do, but I know what I'm here for and I know it's all part of it. And so sometimes you, you kind of just trudge through the mud and it's just another boring day. And sometimes there's big days and exciting days. But for me, as somebody that's can try to control every part about and I was good at this because I was intellectual, I, I was smart, I was capable, right? I had confidence in myself. And so I tried to control everything in terms of my daily life and my business and, you know, all this stuff to the point where I got to that American dream, right? The house and the, the girl and the dogs and the job and all this nonsense, right? And I was like, this is stupid. This is not what I want at all. Um, and so controlling things for me was the wrong path. And as I let go of that and, and open myself up to whatever is there. And it's funny because I wasn't a spiritual person. I wasn't a religious person growing up. So now when I say things like, you know, let go and let God or um, I'll let God determine the path. Right? I mean, I, to me, it's like I kind of laugh at this stuff because I'm totally not secular in that regard. Um, but yet I'm very much in alignment with that, which is like, I'll oh, just see what happens. And if I show up every day and I trust and I feel my way, this is to me it's an ever evolving process that has led to really, really good things. So I'm just, I'm just kind of a science guy. And I'm like, okay, well, if it worked before, I'm going to keep doing it. If it keeps working, I'll just keep doing more of it. Right. So, uh, it's led to more happiness. It's led to more peace. It's led to more, um, you know, less anxiety and stress. So I have no idea, you know, what we're still going to be, um, our, our focus is the human longevity project at this moment, because it's a, a way that we can bring people into alignment, um, I think, in a way. And, and it's been very successful in terms of people seem to really enjoy it. And it's a topic, I think, that, that's not going anywhere. So we will continue to be in that space, but I have no idea what the heck is next. So we'll see. I'll figure it out. Well, thank you for your time and presence once again. I just think it's fantastic to have your perspective and also as you've had a deep dive into the topic just to get... Um, uh, that energy and it's good to have you coming from us because we can feel the vibe that you are very fast sharp uh, you know smart and at the same time 
the search for the meaning, the search for your real true self, spirituality, connectedness. Uh, how do you serve? How do you um, be? How do you connect with nature? How do you stay calm and uh, just slow down? And that is already for many of us so difficult. So this is a great example. I wanted to thank you for. Well, thank you for, yeah, thanks for giving me the platform. It's always, it's always a pleasure to chat with people. Um, again, we, we didn't have this planned meeting. We, we ran, we met randomly and, uh, and connected. So, um, I, I'm very grateful for you to have me on the, on your podcast and, uh, to share this message. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. All right.